And, and I just want to follow up. It's funny. I can recall a couple times where an alternate has, you know, asked a question during a presentation. Quite frankly, everybody, no one else thought of it. And it was like, wow, that, that talk about it, what a catch that that person had. Um, so it can be very valuable uh, to, to participate. So it's, it's an important process. Positively. Sorry, a little technical issue yeah. going on behind the scenes here. Being Technical difficulties <laughs> beyond our control. <laughs> the theme of the day. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Ah, uh, let's see where are they at. Um, all right. When deliberating on a variance specific to a forty by fifty foot setback, do you do any discussions not related to the setback become a condition of the decision? To back. Um, I'm I'm going to interpret this question as being about um, what are reasonable conditions, which is a question that comes up a lot, and actually I've heard it a lot lately. Mm -hmm. What kinds of conditions can we attach to a variance, say? Um, and particularly, I've been asked a few times if if the board had authority to attach conditions to a, a variance that involved a different aspect of the property that they were concerned about that had yeah. nothing to do with the actual variance they were asking for. Um, and what I have generally believed is that, um, is that conditions need to be somehow related to the specific thing they're asking for. So let's imagine that there is a house um, and someone wants to um, put an addition on the house and requires a variance because it will encroach into the setback. Um, and the board has concerns about something going on on the opposite side of the house that has nothing to do with the setback. Um, I think in that case, it would be proper to attach conditions that affect the setback, such as the height of the addition or, um, uh, you know, something about the roof or, you know, draining water or something like that in that area. But the rest of the property that doesn't affect what's going on in the setback probably shouldn't be the subject of any conditions on that variance. Yeah, I, 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 if I'm hearing that question correctly, and I've been presented with this a couple times too, uh, hey, you know, we're, we're in this process, we took a view of the property, and we found what we consider a violation somewhere else on the land. Can we essentially, and these are my words, not their words, we kind of hamstring them and say, you'll get your approval, but it's a condition of approval. You've got to go remedy this violation. I, I have taken the position, like Christine said, no, that is not. That, the way to deal with the violation is through the enforcement process. It's a separate issue. Right. Um, if, if these are really separate issues we're dealing with, and that the, the approval and conditions that follow that need to be germane to that, to that variance, uh, and if something separate that's going on, deal with that accordingly. That, that, that's where I landed on that. I, I tend to agree. I have seen ordinances where there is something in the in the ordinance that says that if you're in violation, you can't do X or Y. Hmm. I don't know of a case that's upheld those, uh, at least none to my knowledge, uh, or, or where it's been challenged. So I agree. It's you, your conditions are supposed to be reasonable and germane to the relief being granted. Uh, my favorite one is the Garrison v. Henniker case, where the ZBA said, you're going to merge all these 1,600 acres of parcels into one, and you've done such a great dog and pony show about your safety record. If you sell the property or convey it to, you know, somebody else takes over the business, uh, they've got to come back in uh, while the Board, though the court did not expressly say that's a great idea, they did include that in their in their uh, opinion and didn't attack it in their opinion. So is it dicta? Is it an inferred blessing? I don't know, but it's those were germane to the to the issues that the variance was being sought for them. All right. Um, 
There was a question about, do you have model rules of procedure we can adjust for our specific community? I believe we talk about some of that in our handbook. Did yes. Anything else to add to that? No, yeah. I, I, in my written materials, that's what I'm referring to. So don't reinvent the wheel. Exactly. But run yeah. everything by your lawyer to make sure. I have and seen they rules. may have <laughs> samples. Right. And I have seen rules where there is something that is taken from a model and there is a parenthetical of where you're supposed to make a choice and the rules were just taken. They're all in there. And the, the parentheticals are still there. Let's not do that, shall we? <laughs> yeah, there's usually a pretty large overlap of the rules, but I know a couple of distinctive distinctions I'm thinking of is, um, well, one is the butter, I mean, the, excuse me, the um, alternate participation, which we talked about. Um, first of all, having it in there somewhere, and then to what extent the alternate participates. Also, the time limit for appealing to administrative appeals. Yeah. Um, you know, I believe the statute has not changed remarkably in that regard, but it's still within a reasonable yeah. period. And I know I've seen everything from 20 days to 30, 40, I think one at 60. Oh my gosh. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. But, you have, you have yeah. one town that we ran into that had a 65 day one. And it's like, what? Yeah. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Ow. Yeah. So I'll put my plea in here. If you're going to adopt rules of procedure, please, please, please run them by your attorney. Yeah, please, 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 please. <laughs> okay, next question. Um, can a ZBA request an applicant to pay into an escrow account to cover the cost of technical assistance, for example, hydro hydrogeological study, to the board as a planning board does? Yes, indeed. They yeah. certainly can, and the same rules apply as for the planning board. Yeah. Okay. With with different statutory numbers, but it's the same language. Exactly. Right. Yes, exactly. Um, the the one well, there are a couple of limits on it, but one is that um, it can't overlap. It can't be the same kind of study that's required by the planning board. Both boards can't require the applicant to pay separately for the same kind of study. So you have to use the same one. So whoever's on first gets the tab. Right. Yeah. Um, but it's it is a it's an idea worth considering um, if you have an estimate of how much this is going to cost to have them pay up front and put it in an escrow account because um, I have worked with towns in the past that have had trouble getting the applicant to pay after the fact, right. even if they have signed something ahead of time saying I agree I will pay this. And, and just to, to follow up, the, the statute is 676-5, Roman 4, and Roman 5, little subsets there. That's the reference. I just had to grab it. It was somewhere it's in my right. mind. All right. Um, and, and before we leave that one, it will be case by case, obviously. You know, for the deck coming oh, in, yeah. you're probably not going to need one for the special exception for the big uh, uh, convenience store coming in, you might, because you may need, need various things analyzed for the, the tanks and the whatnot, so. Mm -hmm. If it's on a piece of property with a lot of wetlands and you need someone to do a, and they maybe they need a, um, if it's a residential subdivision and they're going to all need wells, you might want to have, you know, something done about that if there's an aquifer concern or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it is. But they'll all be different. Yeah. Right, this next question is related to remote participation. Is there any provision for remote participation by someone other than a board member? For an example, an applicant's consultant. Hmm. Not specifically. Oh. Um, assuming that the board members are all in the room or otherwise complying with RSA 91A, um, I have heard of boards that have allowed um, an applicant's consultant to appear 
electronically, you know, video conference or something, um, because they happen to be located in another state and their materials are actually have been submitted, so the board has access to them. Um, I I think it's allowed, um, but I do not think it's required. Yeah, I think that's a, as far as I know now, a discretionary function with the board to allow it. Um, I don't, don't really see a reason why they should disallow it if it's, again, someone who can't be there, but they got to move forward. It's, you know, especially that time crunch, a 90 day period we got these days. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if they can, if they're clear and people can hear the person and, and the people have access to the materials. Uh, that are being discussed. I you know, don't want to see a problem with it, but again, discretionary at this point. I don't believe there's anything that, that requires them to do that. I don't think so either. Uh, there are certainly um, smaller communities around the state that are still not set up well to have uh, video conferencing yeah. and in their meeting space. Um, many more do today than did three years ago, I'm willing to bet, but I don't think I don't think a town is required to go out and invest in a big system in order to facilitate that. Right. I agree. All right. These next two are uh, related to enforcement of the zoning ordinance. Um, in a town where there is no zoning enforcement officer, what is the obligation of the body that issues building permits to know all of the zoning requirements? Hmm. Yes, they 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 should. <laughs> uh huh. Um, I think it's the same for anyone who's issuing yeah. permits. Yeah. Yeah, the Paul Senior Select Board or whomever is the designated board official um, needs to be familiar with their ordinance. If, if there's someone charged with enforcing it, and if, if, usually if you don't have an official, like a, a building inspector, I use that term a little loosely. Uh, or a code enforcement officer or something, then the governing body is going to be the one responsible. I mean, we all have some towns that have that mechanism. Yep. And right. um, they need to be uh, educated on what your work says. Uh, they got they got to enforce it. That's their job. Yep. Um, and then the second one is, I, under, I understand that ZBAs don't have enforcement power. Where a town, where a community decides not to enforce the zoning ordinance, what is the appropriate remedy? Um, that is, I have I have dealt with this problem um, recently-ish, and um, unfortunately, the ZBA as a board has no authority in that situation. However, every member of the ZBA is a resident of the community and has an equal opportunity to complain to whomever is in charge of enforcement. Um, and if those complaints fall on deaf ears, perhaps their next step would be to complain to the people who have hired the enforcement authority. Um, and I mean, ultimately, it's a political problem rather than a problem, a legal problem for the ZBA. And, and by saying that, I don't mean to discount how important that is. I understand that it can be incredibly frustrating to be in that position. Um, but as ZBA members, you don't have any particular status to deal with it. Right. You have and it's standing issue of, of, is it a violation that is so clear that uh, a mandamus action, which is a very high bar, could be brought to Superior Court. Uh, you don't see too many of those because there's always usually some ambiguity uh, in play. Is it something that there is relief in the court under the uh, 677 rules? Again, the answer is it depends. So each of those instances uh, the individual will need to talk with their own attorney, but I agree wholeheartedly. The ZBA, it's not within your jurisdiction either to enforce or to sue for enforcement. 
Okay, next question is regarding variants. Um, person asked to address, please address applicant using financial costs as a hardship. Using financial cost? Costs, the cost, yeah. Well, it's it's no longer an express provision. That was one of the uh, the building blocks in the BOSHA criteria. Uh, so it was clearly there and is clearly now no more there. However, it is, I think, can come in when you're considering substantial justice because one part of the prong is the harm to the applicant that's not outweighed by a benefit to the general public. Um, it definitely was involved in the Farrar case, Farrar v. Keene, with the 7,000 square foot plus house. Um, it could theoretically come in as um, an element of reasonableness. Mm -hmm. I need to do this. It's a reasonable thing because. The, the alternative uh, would be unreasonably expensive. Unreasonably expensive. Um, yeah. I think that could be. Yeah, so I, 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 I'm not seeing it as boxed out, but it's no longer completely clearly in mm -hmm. because Moshe has been removed. <clears throat> I think the one thing that's totally out is the applicant who comes in after the fact and says, but it would be really expensive for me to undo what I did. And the answer to that is, Tough nuggies, you shouldn't have done what you did before you came in. Unless you're in for an equitable waiver. And then that okay. economic yeah. is clearly in. Yes. So, but you asked the question on variance. Yeah, I, I agree. Coming in for forgiveness rather than permission. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah Chris mentioned about the economic issue under reasonableness. And I actually had a case a little while ago where that was, was argued and kind of on the table. And you know, my review of the case law, it's you know, it's still it's still in there. They still talk about it kind of indirectly. So yeah, it's not like a clear item anymore in any test or standard, but it's it's I think it's it's still in play. Uh, you know, not uh, not as significant as significant as it once was, but it's uh, I think it's still there. I think it will still gain some sympathy with some courts, um, maybe depending on circumstances. So, um, I, but this way, if someone brings it up, I wouldn't completely just exclude it and say, we're never going to consider this yeah. kind of circumstance. All right. Um, this one was uh, during Chris's presentation when you were talking about HB 1661, section 20, which created the RSA 677 colon 20, fee shift in bonding. Um, the question was, what constitutes receipt? Missing info, missing fees? I, we don't have a clear case on that, but it, I would think if, if the packet was significantly incomplete or they hadn't paid the fees, um, then you haven't received the complete application yet. Keeping in mind, however, that um, we do have more case law or, or um, verbiage, shall we say, in what is a complete application in the planning board world rather than in the ZBA world. The ZBA world, you really is, there's an application. Did you fill out the application? Did you pay the fee? What they come in with as, you know, their because statements, you know, why do they think they meet the criteria? I've seen things that are half a sentence and you're going, okay, what, you know, is there enough to meet their burden of proof? Um, and an, an application like that, I frequently see denied because if, especially if the applicant doesn't come in and say more, um, so the 90 days is from receipt of the application. 
you as a ZBA don't really have as much problem as the planning board world does. This is the long and the short of it. So uh, they got to pay the fee. And that's usually at the desk when the, the applications receive. Hopefully that helps. There's a follow up with that is how do you deal with missing information, missing plans, missing fees? Well, uh, train your train your desk clerk that, you know, I'm not taking this piece of paper until you give me a check. When you if you don't have your checkbook now, come back with the application when you have your checkbook. Um, missing plans. Again, it's you as a ZBA have your rules of procedure and that rule set of rules of procedure can say what is a completed application and the form itself can say we need three copies of of the plan on you know 24 by 36 size and 10 copies 11 by 17 and and whatnot so you have a checklist and if they don't meet the checklist it's not a complete application and the clerk says this is what you miss missing come back to me when you got it uh, the next question was could chris reiterate what he feels should be the disclaimer at the end of the fees posted oh yeah um something along the lines of fees for third parties three fees for third party review such as legal counsel engineers etc may be charged depending upon the circumstances of the case something along those lines you're merely wanting to flag the issue and you have statutory authority that we've previously made reference to because there was a disconnect in the legislation i am kind of suggesting that as belt suspenders and rivets so you avoid somebody saying this bill here says you can't charge me anything if it's not on the list and you didn't put that on the list. You're not paranoid if they're really out to get you. <laughs> um, next question is, we sometimes do not receive all the return receipt mail cards from abutters. If time permits, we try to call them. Can we proceed without knowing if the missing abutter has received the variance application notice? Yes, because the statute yeah. says you are required to mail. It does not yeah. say they are required to receive. That is what it says. Absolutely. If you do call, though, that's even better. And another, another technique, and, and again, it depends. It, you can get a little cumbersome depending on how many you're mailing, but uh, a lot of times sending out a first-class copy along with a certified copy, if it doesn't come back, it's presumed that it got there. So again, it doesn't mean a lot, but it means better than nothing. And you say, we didn't get the card back, but the other first class letter didn't get returned undeliverable or wrong address or anything. So, again, just a little backup. Some people won't sign for a certified letter, <laughs> just as a matter of principle. Yeah, I'm one of those people. <laughs> just kidding. You're causing the trouble. <laughs> if, uh, uh, but one important thing, if you know they didn't get it, um, yeah. Right. Then I I think yeah. you're you have an obligation to try to get them actual notice somehow if you know they're not getting it. Yep. Right. That's, Which that's sending it first class or delivering it to them or emailing it to somebody whose email address you have, you know, whatever you can do that you can have a paper trail of. Yeah. Um. I had a question re regarding variance criteria. Um, Christine used an example of voting on an individual variance criteria. The presentation indicates, this is a long one. The presentation indicates it is up to the procedures of the board to decide voting procedures. But for approval of a variance, isn't it true that each 
member must vote the variance as a whole? It's not actually. Um, there are boards that vote on each criterion separately, and there are boards that take one up-down vote after a thorough discussion of all five. Right. And either way can be used. It's just that you have to pick one and stick with it until you formally decide to change it. Um, right. But as I said, there are different schools of thought about which way is better. Yeah, I mean, I know personally I, I do not like voting on each individual criteria. Uh, I, I just have never liked that approach. Christine mentioned during our presentation a, a, a good hypothetical. Of you could technically have one where everybody votes on each criteria, but yet there's not a majority, three members, who vote in favor of all five just because of the way the votes all come out, you know, each factor. And you get a clever attorney like Chris on the other side, he's going to play with that, and the judge is going to start scratching his head going, wait a minute, so, you know, if, if I don't have three members all in favor of at least, you know, all five criteria, how do I have affirmative vote for the variance? And that, if nothing else, just makes it a lot more confusing and a lot more difficult to, to uh, present to the court. So I prefer a robust discussion of all criteria and then a vote up or down, but then explaining either way down. Which ones are missing? Line. Yeah. Even if you grant it, you have findings as to why you grant it. But I just think that's cleaner and easier to, to process. But that's right. just me. And, and I agree. It's one where, from from a board standpoint, have that full and fair discussion of everything. So you have a consensus. Do we do we think this is here? And use those because statements in the in the discussion. So you're tying evidence back in to help make the findings that are now required. What Christine was talking about is, in, you know, of the, of the, you use one form until you choose to use another one. That's now been codified in 673 uh, 2C, one, excuse me, 1C, so that you have to, uh, if you're going to change from the uh, separate votes to a single vote. You need to make that decision known. It doesn't take effect for 60 days and it doesn't take effect to those things that are already in the pipeline. Um, so you can't retro it back um, to have it be applicable. You're supposed to stay with the same format. Yeah. There's a follow up uh, statement after that is that there must be three members voting in support to decide approval of an appeal, i.e. in case of a variance. If a member does not find that appeal meets all five criteria, then that member cannot vote to approve the variance. So not sure the value of voting the individual criteria. Well, again, yeah, that gets back to the, the hypothetical that, that could happen. You have five members voting and you don't have yeah, I mean, Christine McGregor, I actually had to scratch my head when she said it, so I think technically that can happen. Yeah, think um, about it. If you, if you have right. a, a grid that's five by five, there are five members going down the left side, and there are five criteria for a variance going across the top, and member A says no on uh, substantial justice, and member B says no on... Uh, spirit of the ordinance, and member C says no on property values and so on. Everybody thinks, every member thinks that the application fails one of them, which means every one of them, if they're taking an up-down vote at the end, should say no, although they all have different reasons, so clearly they need to have more of a discussion. Uh, but if you just looked at the vote on each one, you'd have four to one yes. It's confusing and it makes my head spin a little. It's a little too close to math. <laughs> Which is why we seem like we're coming out in favor of one up-down vote, but, but buttressed by a very thorough discussion on all five criteria that allows you to elaborate on which ones you think were met and which ones were not and why. And the and why is really important now per yes. seriously important. 
1661. All right, someone asked um, if you have any tips for how much research and question preparation before hearing without being accused of prejudging an application. Oh. Well, I'll be the first to say I have research, preparation. You know, it, to me, that's very distinct. I, I'm fine. If someone wants to understand a topic, they want to understand the property, they want to understand things. I, I think prejudgment sometimes gets a little um, used a little too um, loosely. Um, and I, I don't fault members who want to make sure they understand what they're looking at and what they're going to be uh, dealing with. And if they want to look at outside, you know, sources like, uh, you know, if they want to phone up on wetlands information and whatnot, just to understand how things work. Uh, generically, uh, I'm, I'm generally okay with something like that, uh, if they're doing their own homework, but that's very different than if someone is literally making their mind up ahead of time as to whether or not they're going to uh, approve a project based on some, some bias he or she may have. Uh, it's a fine line, no question about it, but uh, I, I will say all, you know, all research is, is prejudgment. I suppose. Christine? Uh, for me, the kind of research, well, first of all, thoroughly reading all of the material that you're given before the hearing is absolutely critical. Yeah, yeah. Correct. That, that should be the culture of every zoning board. Um, you read the whole packet before you get there and make sure that you, you're familiar with what's going to happen so that you have questions ready or that your mind is ready to think of questions as you're sitting there through the hearing process. That's one thing. Um, research can be a tricky thing because um, if you were in court, you wouldn't want the judge going out and, say, talking to all of the people who might have information about this. That's not what judges do. And um, I have talked with members of um, a couple of ZBAs who have said, well, I, I've talked to some people I know in town government and we have, you know, there's some problems with this and I'm really worried about whether this applicant is going to be um, responsible because I know that they've been doing some other bad things that I've recently found out about. Uh, that kind of makes my hair stand on end. Right. Um, that should not be happening. And I agree with that. The evidence that you're supposed to be considering <laughs> is supposed to come in to you from the applicant and their team, if they have one, and the abutters and you know anyone else you hear, um, the when courts say it's okay for boards to rely, board members to rely on their personal knowledge, um, I think it's a very different thing to say, okay, you have this traffic guy who says this is what the impact is going to be on this intersection. Your traffic guy has never actually been to our town. I have lived here all my life, and here's what I know about that intersection. I think that's very different. Um, or, you know, this is what that street is like. Um, this is the, the character of that street, and I, you know, this seems like something that would change it. Um, I, I get worried when when research is not of a generic nature to understand, you know, how do wetlands work um, right. or something like that. Yeah, I'm talking really about subject matter specific stuff, not like for Christine saying, I don't encourage people to go out and start talking to oh other officials and, right, and all that stuff. But that's not what I'm talking about. You are not an investigator. Yeah. And again, that, and that wouldn't come up very often either, what we're talking about, this kind of research. Um, but occasionally someone wants to bone up and be, have a better knowledge base of what they're dealing with so they can ask the right questions. Um, that's, but that is, it's, it's a delicate line. So I think what we're all probably going to say at the end of this thing is, you know, as usual, maybe you talk to your town council yeah. to see big right. guidance on how far someone should go with that. But of course, there are some members who might just do it on their own and not ask first. So <laughs> then we have to... Never. With that. Never. I'm shocked. Uh, you see that? Never. What do you think, Chris? Yeah. One thing I would add is um, remember you're judged 2020 hindsight by the juror standard. So if there is an error, a judge is going to be looking at what you did and trying to ascertain, did you cross the line looking backwards? What you should have done right, what you shouldn't have done as to what a juror would do. A juror can't go out and investigate a case that's in front of them. 
They're only allowed to hear the evidence that is presented, admitted into court and what is what is before them. You as a ZBA member, I, I completely agree. Read the friggin packet. Know your know your zoning ordinance. Know your rules of procedure. Look at those plans that are there in front of you. Depending upon your rules, those are prepared by various professionals who have their own set of standards that they have to comply with before they put their seal on it. So if you have questions about things, you raise them ideally in the meeting. The, the wonders of the internet is you can find anything on the internet and 12 different answers to the same question on the same facts. So sometimes you, you get um, the old adage, garbage in, garbage out in play. So if you come though with a fair and impartial mind to the table, having educated yourself on what is before me today, what is that plan asking for? I think you're, you're well on your way to a, to a proper uh, determination. If you feel you need more information, however, ask for it. You can do that in the meeting. You can do it through your staff, the town planner or the circuit rider, whoever's helping out your town. You can ask it during the meeting of the applicant and their consultants. I'd really like to understand what's happening here. They may tell you exactly what's happening. They may say, oh, I'm going to have to go back and look at that. I didn't think of that. And that's where your reviewing expert can come in also. If it's necessary, depending upon the project, it's not going to be so for a deck. It may well be for, for all variances associated with a new shopping center or something like that, that you have the town engineer looking at this and giving you the board professional opinion on, yes, this meets it, no, it doesn't, and here's what they have to do. Hope that helps. Yeah, I echo what Chris said. I think, I think in those towns that have the, the resources, whether it's, you know, you have a, an engineer who's, who's a, on staff, or you have a planner or a servant rider who's in attendance, et cetera, uh, certainly that's your, that's your great first, first place to go uh, mm -hmm. rather than going it alone. Um, and I, I, I echo that, that if you utilize those resources as, as much as you can. If you're fortunate enough um, to have them. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, some smaller communities we all know just have nothing like that. But again, many, many do have something along those lines. So yeah, I just want to echo that. Um, use those resources. I got uh, two chats up to follow up and it's the exact same question. Um, is it okay for ZBA members to drive by the properties prior to the meeting? Yeah. Positive. Sure. In fact, most yeah. applications are, are granting permission to walk the property. You've got to see what the what the subject is. Um, you know, each each piece of property and the law is different. So yeah. that you you have to know, okay, this this plan is showing me X. A plan potentially could be wrong. It doesn't have everything that it needs. You could see, hey, wait a second. I'm seeing this stream come down here. That's not on this plan. Why not? Or these houses next door are smack up against the line. And what they're asking for may impose on that existing situation or may be no harm because of that existing situation. Alternatively, the abutter houses are way far away. Nobody's going to see this, is the argument. So you get to see the property and get a feel for why you're being asked for this relief. Just please don't go on to somebody's property without getting permission first. Right. And that's what I'm saying. Even if your application, application will be the grant of that permission. Yes. Yeah, so know that you study your own applications to, to know if you have that ability or not. I, I've right. seen that and I've seen some that don't have it. And, uh, right. Yeah. You know, it's it's definitely a drive by. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. That's at, critical. At least drive by, though. Yeah. Definitely. And, and with right Google away. Earth, you can see a heck of a lot. <laughs> uh, sure. 
It is handy. Um, next one is, how can one efficiently handle multiple cases for exactly the same special exception? The findings of fact are generally identical. Chris just said it, every piece of property legally is considered unique. And I think you have to, you have to hear them, right. you know, now, one, one by one. One thing you, that you can do if you are seeing the same case over and over again, special exception or variance. Special exception is, remember, something that's allowed in the zoning ordinance. So it's it's a checklist and uh, that may not be a problem to have time after time the same kind of uh, relief asked for. And in theory, your findings of fact can be fairly close, but do remember to change the names and the address. Um, <laughs> on, on a variance, if you're seeing the same thing over and over and over again, it may be one of those things that the ZBA wants to communicate with the planning board and say, hey guys, we'd love for you to amend the zoning ordinance <laughs> and say that a shed can go within five feet of a, of a rear setback, a rear property line. Um, you know, how many shed cases have we all seen? It's one of those oh things. So do we really need to be here for a shed case? I have one of my beloved communities that I'm in front of all the time up here in the lakes is the only one with a 65 foot setback. Everybody else has the 50 foot setback that the state has from the lake. So there are a heck of a lot of applications that tend to be granted for things within the 65 foot. It may be time for a planning board amendment to go to the voters. But each totally town, agree. Each town is its own. And what gets what gets to the voters comes by two ways, either through the planning board or a petition warrant article. And you on the zoning board are uniquely situated to pick up on those problems where maybe your ordinance has a provision that just doesn't make sense anymore right. in a particular area. So you can point it out to the planning board. You can't make them do it but you can talk to them and explain what you see and what you think ought to happen. And they should listen to you, at least. They may not do it, but yeah. hopefully they'll listen. All right, next one. Um, can the ZBA take into consideration during their deliberations provisions of the site plan or subdivision regulations? My initial reaction is no. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's hey. you're, you're there for the zoning ordinance. Your appeals of administrative decision can't come to you based on site plan and subdivision. Okay. And you have, you will have many cases where a case has to come to you as ZBA first, and then we'll have to go to the planning board for site plan or subdivision approval. Great. The, the planning board deals with the parameters of the site plan and subdivision, I think. Um, let them play with that. Whether they will or no, to your satisfaction, I don't think is the real issue. Your issue is, do they meet the five statutory criteria for a variance from the zoning ordinance? Do they meet the checklist for a special exception? Mm -hmm. That's your purview. But um, Christine, Matt, what do you think? I agree with you. Yeah, completely. I think separate boards, separate kind of authority, governance, um, different set of rules apply in each one. And the fact that someone's before you for a variance at the ZBA and perhaps this project, if it's granted, will violate X regulation of the site plan, that's not our, that's not our call. Um, planning board can deal with that. And then that'll be dealt with accordingly. So I, I think we're all in agreement. 
it's also a different level of detail. You'll yep. tend to be at like 10,000 feet for the ZBA. You'll come down to a foot for the planning board world. Um, so yeah. Yeah. again, let the planning board do its job with all that minutia. You guys stay at, at is this allowed under the zoning uh, ordinance, either through variance or special exception? Yeah. <clears throat> all right. Um, next question. If someone wishes to build on a, quote, paper, unquote, road, would that be a special exception or a variance? That depends on what your ordinance says. Right. A special exception is is a use that is a use or, or a structure or whatever that is allowed in specific situations, meeting a set of conditions. And so it's something that if your ordinance says that, then they would need it for that. Um, if your ordinance says that you can't build on a class six road, then I guess they would need a variance. It really depends. Yeah, and and, um, and I'm not sure that that's really in the ordinance anyway. Would it be? And with with the question phrased as it is, build on a paper road, that tickles in the back of my mind that it's really a question of will a applicant meet the criteria for getting a building permit out of whomever, the selectman or uh, building inspector right. pursuant to 674.41. Yeah. And remember that one has a number of passages. Um, one of which is you don't need to uh, get shunted out of getting a building permit if the road in question is shown on a plan approved by the planning board. Mm -hmm. We've seen many that are approved, the plan is recorded, and the damn thing's never built out all the way. Sure. So technically, that conforms with the provisions of 674.41 and entitles the lot owner to get a building permit. But it's not getting a building permit from the ZBA, it's getting a building permit from somebody else. Right. Right. All right, the next few questions are about procedures. Um, do procedural changes need to be approved by Board of Selectmen Planning Board by majority of the ZBA? The ZBA, your rules yeah. of procedures are your rules. Yeah. It's good to be king. <laughs> yeah, it's just this you. One. Just you. No one else has control over the rules except the legislature and the court. Um, our ZBA procedures spell out a list of what we want for a complete application. Example, site plans with a list of specific items identified. If everything is not there, we vote the application is incomplete and let the applicant submit the missing materials for a future meeting. How does the new 90-day requirement affect this practice? Ooh, interesting question. Well. I think the most interesting part of that question is that the law doesn't actually require the zoning board to find an application complete. That is only required for the planning board. The zoning board statutes don't say anything about a completeness finding. Having said that, I am aware that there are a lot of boards that do it. Um, and from the perspective of assisting people with the process, which you have an obligation to do, um, I think it's a great idea to have a list and say, here's what we need in order to process your application. Um, so I, I'm, there is no provision in the 90 day period um, that takes into account a completeness finding. It just says from the date of receipt of the application. So um, it doesn't say the receipt of a complete application. So I'm not, I'm not sure how that would work together. I, I think if, um, well, I guess what I think is, if it's complete enough 
to get started, you should probably get started. Um, tell the applicant what's missing. Here's the information we need. We're going to need that from you at the next meeting. Or if you're lucky enough to have staff, have them get in touch with the applicant and say, you've submitted most of it, but we still need you know, these two things. Could you please submit it before, before the next meeting so we can do that? And if they don't submit everything, obviously then you're in a situation where you don't have enough information. So you can ask them if they are willing to waive the 90-day period, and if they're not, you can deny it without prejudice. Um, for the most part, applicants want to get what they're asking for. So if you are reasonable in trying to move things along with them, they will usually be reasonable in waiving the 90 days. Um, right. The planning board's been operating under a time period forever, and they manage exactly the same way. Um, but the difference is your statute doesn't say from the day you decide it's complete. It says from the day it's, it's received. Yep. And I yeah, agree I with that. Days. Yeah, I, I, yeah, exactly. At 90 days, our gun goes off the minute that thing comes in, and then we have choices to make. Uh, obviously, as we've all been talking about, these applications can run the gamut from a simple shed and a setback to a large you know, retail facility or out the store, whatever they want to put into an area or something else where it's going to involve a lot more um, details. So obviously, whatever town, if you're uh, you know, requesting certain material, that should be reasonable depending on the kind of application you're getting. Uh, you know, I think a, a court is going to pay attention to that. So if you're holding it up unreasonably, uh, being too aggressive with your requests, then that might not go well. But I agree with Christine, and I think thankfully now that we have this denial without prejudice option, um, something like that could be exactly where that comes in. So we stay within our time frame, we make a decision, but you know, we just, if we don't have enough, we don't have enough, and the person's got to come back to the drawing board and give us what we need. Right. Try to be reasonable. Right. Yes. With with one additional caveat, remember you have a, a assistant usually at the front desk, and if your procedures are clear on what is a what you need, and there's mm -hmm. ideally a checklist. Many towns that I deal with, both sides of the aisle, we, you know, here's what you need, and some of them say if applicable, uh, but it's it's something you and the and the clerk that processes the application can look through and know fairly quickly if something's missing. You don't have to wait 60 days to say something's missing. Um, but but I love the fact that they finally put in what I've I've long thought the ZBA had the authority to do, deny without prejudice. Here's, what, here's the extra information you need to bring to us, and you're not going to be hamstrung by Fisher v. Dover for doing so. Yep. One of the things that I keep seeing recently um, in Superior Court orders and from the Housing Appeals Board is um, a decreasing tolerance with municipal boards that are perceived not to work well with applicants. Um, it's getting harder to defend that behavior. Mm -hmm. So, um, And one thing that I tell many of the boards and officials that I work with is, a court is going to expect you to behave reasonably even when the other people aren't. That is not fair, but that is how it is. Um, and if you can keep that in mind, understanding that that does not feel fair sometimes, um, you will put your legal counsel in a better position to um, assist you. Right. And the old case of Carboneau v. Rye is still very good law that puts puts yeah. on us as boards the obligation to assist the citizenry in getting through this process. We're not allowed to play gotcha. So mm -hmm. just keep that in mind. Yeah. Um, there's a follow-up qu um, question that came in about the incomplete. If we get an incomplete application, we table it and tell the applicant what we need. I assume if you denied without prejudice, the applicant would have to pay all the fees a second time to bring it back. Well, possibly. 
Um, I mean, yes, but I, I think you might be able to um, waive them in certain conditions. Yes. It does happen. And, and tabling is a, is a good option if you're still within the 90 days. Um, oh, sure. yeah. And one of those things that I have seen is, and, and I'm, I'm just left scratching my, my head, of an applicant who themselves have asked for continuance. And then when the board needs more information going, you've had 90 days to deal with this. It's like, uh, you're forgetting you have yeah. the continuance, right? Yeah. So, you know, again, it's, Christine's point's absolutely on point. The, the courts are not muni friendly. We have to be above reproach. Go that extra mile, be more than patient, ask clearly for the information you need early and see what you can do to make your requirements clear and clean in your rules of procedure and application form. Um, we're about six minutes away from the end, so I'm trying to get us through all of these um, questions here. I think we have about six or seven left, so if we don't get to all of them, we'll figure out a way to get them answered. Um, but the next one is, can a board meet in a workshop forum to review and possibly change procedures, especially with counsel in a non-public forum, or should it be public? Well, I'll speak for myself here. Um, I prefer boards to do as much in public as they possibly can. Um, if a board needs to talk with their attorney about the potential legality of, of procedures they're considering, um, I think that can be done in a non-public session because obviously you can have a non-public session, you can have a non-meeting yeah. to consult with your lawyer to get legal advice about things like how should our procedures work. Um, but the actual meeting where you hammer out what the procedures are going to be, I think that should always be public. I'm not sure what, if you take the legal advice part out of it, I'm not sure what would right. permit a non-public session in that situation. Right. I don't yeah. I don't think you get into non-public really because I don't think you're um, you're qualifying. Remember the court looks at 91A through the lens of everything's open and you have to meet the express exception to go into non-public. Um, the the L provision 91 a colon three Roman two subsection L is framed in the way of receiving or considering advice of counsel in either written or oral form, meaning some somebody's called me and I've told them what to do and they're reporting it back to the board or the board is reading my letter. Well, they can't discuss my letter. <laughs> the, the back and forth. They need me to discuss the letter with me to, I think, in a non-meeting to cleanly do it. What you have in the back and forth of hammering out the procedures is basic legislative function, and that's supposed to handle be handled in public. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yep. And it um, one quick note, the lawyer should never be window dressing in your meeting to allow you to discuss something that Correct. you're not supposed to be discussing in non-public session. Yeah. Um, and you're asking the municipal it. lawyers that we all know are going to call you out on it right away <laughs> and say, you're nope, you can't talk about that. I'm giving you answers. You're asking a follow-up question. You're not using me for discussion between the two of you or the five of yep. you on what do we do here about this case. That ain't happening. Yeah. Yeah, no deliberations in the non meetings. We thought about that one too. All right. Um, this is kind of a long one, and this could be our last one. Um, this is regarding um, hardship, specifically 5A. 
The criteria includes the terminology that states owing to special conditions of the property that distinguish it from other properties in the area. In our community, and I suspect in many others, wherein there are lakes and ponds, many waterfront properties are constrained to land area rather than uniqueness of boundary contours, land topography, ledge or massive rock, et cetera. The property owner may seek to erect a new structure, such as a garage, shed, or addition to the residence, consistent with the typical residential properties, including some surrounding properties, and perhaps otherwise meeting the other four criteria. How can the property owner satisfy this fifth criteria when surrounding properties are similarly constrained in area and those surrounding properties may or may not have similar structures? Uh, I'll dive at that. Um, again, each property is unique. Every property up here in the lakes that is lakefront will have some impact of wetland, but I don't know of two properties that have the same impact of wetland. Um, you have, as the example said, there's some of them that are built upon and some of them that are not. And that's a difference. The house that was built there in 1970 may be in a location that is not allowed today. So it's a non-conforming structure. Your zoning ordinance will have provisions about how to deal with that. Certain certain towns have a, you can't do anything without a variance. Certain ones say you can do 400 square feet or 900 square feet, or you can go up but not out. Again, it's the difference of your, your community's uh, zoning ordinance. But each, the, 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 Criteria is not looking at generalities. It's looking at specifics. Do the surrounding properties have basically the exact same situation going on? That house is 10 feet from the wetlands rather than 50 feet from the wetlands or 20 feet from the lake when it's supposed to be 50 or 65 feet from the lake. Um, depending upon what all of those circumstances are. Think about it as bricks in a wall. What are the individual bricks involved for this property? Also involving in the lakes region, anytime you're dealing with the ponds and the lakes, you're also having to jump through the hoop at DES for a shoreland impact permit. Um, and certain times, we see an applicant come in with the golden ticket. They've gotten their DES shoreland permit. Other times they're waiting to get ZBA approval before going to DES. So, again. Chris, I can think of something. Um, there was a case that you and I were involved with where um, many of the lots surrounding this one lot um, were of similar size, had a similar size house on it. There was a similar setback issue for many of them, but this house in particular had, um, there was a well on one side, a well and a septic on one side of the house that made putting what they wanted to build, uh, a garage, impossible really on that. On, it had to go on the other side because otherwise they were going to have to move all of this subterranean stuff. Um, and that was a different situation from surrounding properties. Correct. Um, so... Like you said, it's it's a matter of the specifics of each property, um, the specifics that relate to the relief that they're seeking. What are they asking for a variance for? What is the condition of this property or conditions that make it affected by the setback provision differently from others? Right. And in the Farrar case comes to mind also. There you had a whole neighborhood of these old Victorian homes. The issue in play was many of the homes had been carved up to multifamily. Many of the homes had been carved up to offices. And the question was, could this one be carved up into a mixed use? And the zoning ordinance was silent. So you're looking at what is the relief requested and where is, where is the hardship? Where is the harm also? 
You know, what are the spe special conditions of this property? In Farrar, this is the last one that's a, a, a single family home. This is the one that has X number of square feet of parking already. And you don't, they're not asking for more. Uh, this is the one that's on the, the boundary with the residential zone. And some of the others are not. So it's, it's, it's the applicant's burden. Sometimes I have seen board members ask questions because, especially when they're pro se on their own, you know, an applicant may not understand all this. So you are asking questions of, well, tell me what is special about this property that distinguish it from others in the neighborhood. And they're going, oh, well, that means I've got this size and this location, and I've got the well here and the septic there. I've got the parking here. I've got a stream over here. I had one parcel recently where the building envelope was fairly confined, but you could have, if you had it all, you could have put a house in it. One third of the way through it, there was this deep gully stream that cut off a third of the of the building envelope and you couldn't have put a reasonable house in the remaining two-thirds so it was one where that was a special condition of the property that that gully so there are lots of bricks in the wall look at the bricks all right well we are at 204. So unfortunately, we, we did it. This was great. We got through a lot of questions. Um, there's six questions left, and OPD will work on getting uh, answers to those questions, and we'll contact the people that didn't get their questions answered. But thank you, Chris, Christine, and Matt. This was this was great. I think this was a great such new addition to our conference this year. Positively, I, I like this a yeah. lot. <laughs> yeah, I think we will. We'll continue this on. So thank you Very so much. Very much like being live. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes, have us all in the same room next time. That'd We'd be love lovely. that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. All well, uh, we are going heading into a break and we'll be back for 2.15. Well, I'll be talking about floodplain variances. So, all right. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you, Chris, Christine, and Matt. Thank you. All the best, thank guys. Thank you. Be safe out there. Bye. Bye.